My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you have, you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbors no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with, with his feet <laughs> and motions with his fingers, who plots with deceit in his heart, he always stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are det detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Right, so you can have um, Proverbs chapter 6 open on your laps. You're going to need it this morning, not only to check out what I'm saying, but because I'm going to get you to be a bit more involved and share, share your wisdom this morning. Um, we left, as Andy said, chapter five um, of Proverbs, where basically we were staring down the pathway of, of folly. Um, the subject in chapter five was adultery, and um, the writer's gonna return to that in the second half of, of chapter six. But chapter five ended with the last two verses there, that the evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them, the cords of their sins hold them fast, for lack of discipline they will die, led astray by their own great folly. So it's very much that folly is sort of taken centre stage and, and folly is very much in one sense centre stage um, in chapter six. Although I think the purpose of chapter six is to have a good look at what folly does in order to teach us wisdom. So it's still wisdom kind of in charge. It's another interlude um, we said there are five of them in these nine chapters. So chapter six is another sort of wisdom interlude, but it's a little bit like our dancing instructors. So for those of you that don't know, I think it was Valentine's Day last year or the year before that Karen said, I've had this crazy idea, what do you think? And we found ourselves enrolling in a ballroom and Latin dancing class um, a while ago. And um, we've recruited others in the church. So come and chat to us if you'd like to join our club. Um, it's great fun. And sometimes our instructors, um, Natalia, who once would have been Anton Dubeck's dance partner, but she got pregnant, so couldn't. But she's brilliant. Her dance partner, Rob, is brilliant. And now and then, one of their teaching methods is that they will give you the sort of negative. So in the tango, we're told how our posture is to be and how our arms are to be and how we're to look in this direction and so on. And same with the waltz. But now and then, they'll say, some of you, we notice, are enjoying yourself too much as you go around the dance floor and you start talking together, you start looking at each other and they will model what that does to your body and to your frame. And by showing you what it looks like, you think, oh yeah, we don't want to look like that. So you look at the negative in order to think, we, we need to be, I need to be angry, I need to be ruling the roost, I need to be up here with my frame, that sort of thing. So that's what's happening in this chapter. Folly is going to take us down three sort of pathways in this chapter. It's very quick fire, three different situations, and we see what folly is. And now and then we're told what wisdom is. Other times it's just implied very clearly um, by the folly that we see. So I want you to be a bit more involved this morning. We used to do this in our PE lessons year, years ago. When it's cold outside, we need to get active, we need to be involved. So we're going to do that because it's cold outside. So I am going to give this little section here the first example um, or the first thing that, that Folly looks at, which is verses one to five. Let me just read this. So this is your section. I want each section in the building to look at three things. What is the folly? What wisdom is stated or implied? And thirdly, can you give any modern day sort of examples of this folly? It may be most difficult 
for the first group on this. So this group to look at the first five verses, my son, if you put up security for your neighbor, if you've shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you've said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. So you can go into a couple of little groups, two or three groups or pairs, or you can contemplate in the wisdom of your own mind. If you prefer not to talk to people, that's fine. So what is the folly? What wisdom is, is stated or implied? And can you think of any modern day examples? Now this group looked like the sluggard to me. So verse six, this is you. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. And the troublemakers on the balcony... This is your section, verse 12. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart, who stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. So we're looking to chat with a neighbour or a little group. What is the folly? What wisdom is stated or implied? And can you think of any modern day examples? So have a few minutes to, to have a chat have a ponder and then we'll hear your wisdom and then we'll, we'll move along. Okay, let's uh, come back together. It'd be really lovely if, if there is somebody, or uh, one or two people that are brave enough to, to share some of these thoughts when, when we get there. Um, so let's start here with verses one to five. Um, and we've got this sort of putting up some sort of presumably financial security for a neighbour or shaking hands in, in, in a pledge sort of arrangement with them. Um, what's the folly that you could, I, I think this one is, is a fairly tri tricky subject. I should say that all three of these areas will crop up again as we go through Proverbs. So actually one or two of these areas are going to be reasonably brief on this morning, you might be pleased to hear, but we will come back. Um, the sluggard is just a wonderfully comic, tragic figure that crops up again and again and again through the book. So I think we'll have a whole session on the sluggard um, after Christmas when we're feeling all sluggish. Um, right, so let's have a look. Just any thoughts from this part of the room on, on verses one to five? What, what was it? What is the folly? Uh, what wisdom could you detect? And any examples? If you could speak up, that'd be really helpful. Um, okay. Yep, so it could be sort of making a promise to somebody that you may not be able to keep. Um, yep, anything else on the, the, any more on the folly you picked up? It's a bit of a modern context if you didn't hear, sort of out for dinner perhaps with or neighbours in and um, yeah, chatting away. Maybe had a, a drink or two and somebody's talking about a financial situation and, and then the words just come out, well don't worry, we, we can cover that or if that happens or so making some sort of pledge perhaps even a shaking of hands or whatever. Yeah, I didn't actually write this down, but I know in one of the commentaries I read, there was a horrendous example of somebody, um, I think it's the commentary I waved about one week, so if any of you picked that up, you would have read it. I'm sure it was sort of three to $400,000 that this person had sort of under, underwritten. And um, so yeah, so it's a, I think we can get the sense of what's happening. I guess things, I don't know, but maybe a bit, little bit different now with perhaps contracts and legal protections around. I actually thought there's probably perhaps some people in the room that have done this for children with university 
um, with um, sort of rented accommodation and being a guarantor. As I read this, I thought, oh, I, I did that. Um, and again, I think this, that slightly I, I, I sort of highlights also what we're dealing with with Proverbs. You know, we'll see later on in the book two Proverbs that say exactly the opposite thing. And it needs wisdom to know the situation. So I think it, certainly in the university situation, I found myself sort of thinking, OK, so you're sort of underwriting rent for a certain period of time. Um, we're underwriting Esther. So it's a fairly solid uh, situation. We know about the, the, the student loan and all that sort of thing. So you weigh up the situation. There's a need for her to find accommodation, that, that sort of thing. So. Um, a lot of the commentators I've read on these first five verses have underlined the fact that um, generosity is a huge theme for God's people in the Old and the New Testament. So please don't read this as saying, you know, be tight-fisted, don't be generous. But it's clearly saying, be wise with what you have. Be very slow to enter into some sort of deal where with, with the words neighbour but also stranger are used in verse 1 where you could leave yourself, as the words talk about, ensnared. The pictures are wonderful in this chapter, sort of ensnared. And the, the advice, the wisdom, I don't know if we did, I didn't ask you about that. What, what was the wisdom in the middle verses? Did you pick up on what the son's told to do by the father? Yeah. So there is that urging of the son, really, to go to the neighbour. And, and really, it says, doesn't it, to the point of exhaustion, don't sleep, try to free yourself from the arrangement. Now, again, we'd have to hold in, in mind other verses, other proverbs about making promises and commitments and oaths and that sort of thing. But essentially, the wisdom here is, is, to, is to speak to the neighbour and do everything you can to free yourself. And the, and the pictures are there in verse 5 of a gazelle from the hand of the hunter or a bird from the snare of the fowler. Um, if you've gone into that sort of arrangement, do what you can to, to remove yourself from the trap that you've put yourself in. But again, it's not black and white. You know, it's, these things are a, a, a sort of all sorts of shades of grey to try and figure them out. As I say, that will crop up again. But let's go just now for the, the sluggard section um, downstairs on this side of the room. What, what was the folly that you identified? Uh, if you're in the other groups, do look down at the, the passage in the verse, the middle section. What's the folly? What's the wisdom? Can you give any examples? Anyone happy to speak? The word for laziness crops up 35 times in Proverbs, many of them around when the sluggard comes onto the stage. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll get to it later. Time to rest. No real commander or captain steering my ship. Um, anything else on the folly or any wisdom that then is in the passage? Yeah, and who's the great example of, of that in the passage, who's doing that sort of thing? The ant. Yes, very much, yeah, very much there, isn't it? The wisdom of this seems to be the kind of looking ahead, being aware, preparing for what's ahead, um, just like the ant does, where the sluggard is just in bed. <laughs> um, have a look. Let's just roll on a few pages, because there are so many, but I, lo I love uh, chapter 26. Let's sort of flick on to chapter 26 and verse 14. Um, this is one of many little passages that, that comes up. Well, firstly, I mean, we'll, we'll, as I say, we're going to do a full, full look at this later into next year. But verse 13, so the sluggard is also an excuse maker. So a sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As a door turns on its, hinge, as a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns in his bed. And I, this is, I mean... They are referred to the sluggard as a sort of tragically comic figure. Look at verse 15. A sluggard, imagine yourself out on Saturday night and, and the, whoever's home you've gone to has brought out a few dips and, and, and Doritos and whatever. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish but is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. <laughs> Awful, isn't it? Um, any ex other examples did you come up with? Just out of interest, sort of for how it applies now. Did you get to that or, or not? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, need, we need Shark to close his ears, but Susie's mentioned her builder. <laughs> teenagers. 
<gasps> teenagers, adults. <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere actually. Um, so just a couple of thoughts. So in these verses, it's the sort of non-starter, isn't it? How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When? When will you get up? A non-starter. Um, we used to joke about our friend Mike, who was, ended up being nicknamed Albert by Electra, but that's another story. But he had, we, some of us went to university to train to be EP teachers, and we thought we'd be doing a bit of sport, but we've heard that university courses you know, just have a few lectures each week. And we were shocked on our Bachelor of Education. We sort of had one period off a week. We, we were worked hard all week. My friend Mike, who we lived in with a couple of years, did BA, a BA in sports studies. He had three lectures a week. And I'm sure he missed two most weeks because he was in bed. Um, he even missed one of his final exams because he was in bed. He was sat up in bed around about midday, or well, no, it was probably two o'clock in the afternoon, dunking biscuits in his tea when he realised he had an exam that started at one o'clock. So he was into his car. I've never seen him move so fast, the sluggard. Um, but the sluggard is, a, you know, how long will you lie there? When will you get up? We'll see as we go through the book that they're also a non-finisher. That's the kind of putting, dipping in the bowl, but can't really bring it back, sort of makes a start, but never seems to finish. Um, they make excuses, the sluggard in the book. We'll see lots of, oh, the lion, there's a lion outside. And also we'll see that they're an expert, actually. They're, they're looking over the garden fence, telling the neighbours what they should be doing. They, of course, themselves haven't done it or couldn't be bothered to do it or started but haven't finished, but are full of wise advice. So it's a really interesting character, um, the sluggard. And like with the, 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 the person ensnared in their own deal, the, the, the images are very vivid. So um, verse 10 and 11, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding, the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Both of those situations have the element of surprise, of a sudden attack, something happening suddenly unseen. And that's the warning, the wisdom that begins to come. You, you, when, when, if poverty comes, if difficulty comes, you're going to be vastly unprepared. You're in bed thinking about what you might do when disaster strikes. You're unprepared. And as Susie said, the, the example of, of wisdom is the ant, the humble ant, who has no ruler, no commander barking our orders at them, telling them what to do. And yet the ant knows instinctively the wisdom inbuilt into the created order. They're aware of the seasons. They're a self-starter. The ant gathers and stores and is prepared and is ready for when the time comes or the winter comes. Industrious, hardworking, orderly, wise, in such contrast to the lazy sluggard. Uh, the New Testament says to the Christian church, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. We're to be those that work and work hard and for the Lord. And finally, let's go up to the troublemakers on the balcony who were very orderly up there chatting together. Uh, what folly did you identify? Um, what wisdom was implied? Um, or stated, if you could find it in any examples. These two sections, I think, belong together at the end of this chapter, 12 to 15, uh, Troublemaker, and then the six things that the Lord hates. There's so many crossovers with the previous section that I think they go together. But yeah, what folly did you find on the balcony? So a real eye for trouble, difficulty, conflict, and stirring those things up. An expert with the tongue. Yeah. Any wisdom... Yeah, yeah. I think this is the classic one where I don't, other than the warnings of what's ahead, um, the wisdom is very much what I said about the, the dance. You see these terrible things that the Lord detests and hates, and yeah, the opposite is, is wisdom. So learn from the, 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 the bad side. Did you come up with any examples? Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. So just an example from, from a, a, a footballer or somebody on a team sport who's yeah, causing trouble with their actions, the way they're behaving, always in the referee's face, always trying to justify this, that and the other. And um, 
maybe gets away without getting a yellow card and then will wink at his teammate or whatever, you know, that sort of um, thing. And again, you can, I mean, you can probably think of situations in all sorts. You know, there'll be elements of this family, perhaps, a trouble, someone causing trouble, making trouble, winking at one sibling as the other one's thrown under the bus, um, all sorts of plots and, and stuff that can happen in the workplace, clambering on top of each other, trying to put others in a, in a bad light. You know, um, interestingly, and we'll, we'll get to this, but the, um, it's interesting, isn't it, verse 19, the person who stirs up conflict in the community, which may well, again, be the community of, of God's people, um, which is, yeah, we'll get to in a, in a second. The, the level of seriousness seems to ramp up as, as we go through this chapter. And uh, the sluggard is clearly very serious, serious for themselves, perhaps serious for their family that they may be involved in supporting or, or you know, financially supporting or whatever. But, but here we really reach a, a level of seriousness, the troublemaker um, and villain. Um, the seriousness is there in verse 15. Disaster will overtake him or her in an instant. He, she will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. So it's a hugely serious thing. This isn't, it, it's almost like destruction and, 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 and disaster is going to come upon the person that is doing this sort of thing. Um, this person's shifty. Again, the imagery is, is interesting, isn't it? Someone who winks maliciously, verse 13, signals with the feet, motions with the fingers, plots evil with deceit um, in the heart. The, the, two, the thing that holds the two pieces together is the stirring up of conflict. So it's there in verse 14, who plots evil with deceit in his heart, who always stirs up conflict. And then it's there in verse 19, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. So that, that stirring up of conflict among people is the common thing in the two sections. Their body is alive with evil intent in the images as well. And again, we see that physically here, but of course it can be very much uh, as real online, where you can't see often the body and the bodily movements, but that intent to stir up evil. Be careful, be, sorry, beware of this person, I think it's sort of implied, but, but more so, be careful not to be this person. And verses 16 to 19 is interesting, isn't it? Really insight into the character of our, of our Lord. Six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. It's quite an insight moment, that, isn't it? What, what's God like? And he's like a lot of things, but... We're told straight away here, six things he hates, seven that are detestable to him. This again is a, is a thing, a, a mechanism that will crop up, I think again in Proverbs, where seven things are listed. And in this sort of arrangement, the last one is the headline. The last one is, is the sort of the one that the other six feed into. So the haughty eyes, the lying tongue, the hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, are all ways and means by which a person stirs up conflict in the community. Now I want us just pretty much to finish with this thought. Why does God come so strongly for this sort of person in verse 15? Disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. I wonder why you think it might be. Why does the Lord hate this so much? Why, does he, why is, is this detestable to him? The person who stirs up conflict in the community. I think the answer, when you think across the Bible is that God is so, so passionate about his people. So it's interesting, isn't it, in Genesis 12, I was thinking just this morning, back to Abraham, I, I will make your name great, I will make you, you know, a blessing, I will make you into a great nation and, and uh, make you more numerous than the stars of the sky and so on. And the last comment I think is, I will, though, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So come against Abraham and his people, come against God's people, and God comes against you. 
So it's so interesting, isn't it? The, the strength of language in the Old Testament about false shepherds. God detests them because they are the, to be the leaders of his people. It's so striking in the New Testament how strongly Jesus speaks against the, those false shepherds of Israel, those that should be teaching his people the truth and loving them. Jesus has such compassion for everybody he meets, and, I'm, and I, I'm sure he does have compassion for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, but he gets pretty angry with them because God's people are under their care. Or false teachers in the New Testament. You know, this, this, the Lord hates it when anybody would lead his people astray. The language of the New Testament is so strong against those that would cause divisions or those that would stir up conflict or those that would bring, bring trouble to the people of God. Jesus bought his people with his own blood. I was thinking over Christmas, I don't know if you're starting to think now or maybe you're already, I don't know, but you know, part of gift buying is to, is to try, isn't it, to communicate something of our love we're trying to, you know, find the thing that will, yes, the person will enjoy, but we're trying to communicate something of our love in giving gifts or giving our service or time. But Jesus has communicated his love by the sacrifice of his own body, the sacrifice of his own life. He went to the cross, he went to the grave because his people, his father and his people mean so much to him. And we, we exhibit all of these follies, don't we? There are times when we make you know, pledges that we shouldn't make or make promises that we don't keep. There are times in life where the elements of the sluggard are seen in us. There are times when we don't react well to people or we cause trouble or we, we, we have a, a sort of an evil in our heart towards somebody else or we cause a bit of conflict or something. And Jesus looks and sees all of our folly and his response is to come and lay down his life, to stretch out his arms, to bear our folly on his back. Because he loves his people as he loves his father. And so when people come against his people, or come against the church, or look to stir up trouble, or conflict, or, or difficulty, or malicious, or any of those things, the Lord detests that. We need to be really careful, I think, about how we speak about members of his body, that our mouths are not full of corrupt talk or have malicious eyes or feet that are quick to rush into evil or words that stir up conflict or sow disunity. The person that you or I speak of is the person Jesus bled for. Folly is not just about our actions but it starts with a loss or a fear of the Lord we've seen that early in Proverbs haven't we that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and a loss of the fear of the Lord when we lose sight of him well that will be the beginning of folly so it's a call really as we come to the end of this section on on folly and thinking about Andy's um, tulip is to have our hearts right before the Lord first, to see the cross, to see our Saviour, to see his brilliance and his glory, and in, in, in a right fear to fall on our knees before him, to see him and to love him, and that will help us to walk in wisdom uh, in these areas um, and many others. Let's just have a minute to, to think and to pray, um, just to reflect. And as I say, most of these things will come up again um, in more detail later, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to, to see, Lord, the, the shape and the frame of what we're not to be. And we thank you for these examples um, Lord of folly, and we pray that you would help us, Heavenly Father, to, to just have that um, sort of alertness, Father, to, to what folly looks like, to what wisdom looks like. Father, help us in this coming week. Help us to remember, Lord, what Andy 
has taught us that the, the, the thing that looks so beautiful often actually has death within it. So Father, help us as we consider our words, our pledges, our promises. Help us, Father, as we think about our uh, hard-workingness or laziness. Father, help us to be wise like the ant. Help us to be those that are in submission to our commander. Lord, make us aware of the wisdom that you've built into this world. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help every one of us, Lord, to run and flee, Father, from being a troublemaker uh, or a villain. Father, help us to examine our hearts. Help us to champion the people around us. Lord, help us to value them as you value them. Help us to love them as you love them. Lord, guard our tongues that we wouldn't speak ill, Lord, of, of a brother or a sister that the Lord Jesus loves so much. Father, help us to, to, to love your body, to love your people, to love you. Strengthen us in these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.